Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Doug Chilcott uh, from TED. Welcome to TED Global 2013 um, here in the Open Translation Lounge. Today we have Daniel Suarez, who just left the stage moments ago with a talk that was uh, pretty alarming. Um, I think we have a lot of uh, people shivering and have a lot of questions. Um, okay. So we'll get to it at the moment. Um, also joining us on stage here are uh, Urteza from Pakistan, Hugo from France, Els from Belgium, uh, and Christian from Poland. Uh, and joining us via Skype um, at all hours of the night and day, um, we have Lazarus from Greece, uh, Anya from Slovenia, uh, Alberto from Italy, uh, and Yasushi, who is actually, it's midnight in Japan. Uh, <laughs> thank you thank you for joining us. <laughs> okay, actually, I'm just going to um, throw it out to the, Christian, you actually had, mentioned, had a question about the use of fiction. To get oh, yeah, point. I was wondering if, because uh, your talk is a cautionary tale, Yes. But your novel is probably, was probably not meant as one. But th did this uh, angle that we have to be careful about this uh, grow, grow out of your research, or was your novel also meant as something to... I really do um, cautionary tales. And, I, and I'll tell you, I, I, some people, I think, think that uh, thriller writers would just like to be doomsayers. Mm -hmm. But that's not it, actually. I love technology. I mean, I spent nearly 20 years you know, designing software. I, I sort of try to think of it as spotting icebergs as opposed to being a doomsayer. Uh, that doesn't mean you're not going to go anywhere. It just means you might have to turn right or left occasionally to avoid obstacles. Um, I, I think there is a way we can navigate past these and, and get to even a better place than where we are now. We just have to be aware of the terrain, that's all. And so that's really what I try to do. So the cautionary tale is probably a perfect description for it. Teza, um, from Pakistan, you were, we were talking earlier about um, drones being part of the last political campaign in Pakistan. Could you talk a little bit about, obviously, your, the reality yeah. of drones is actually something there's in the country. There's a thing that the second highest uh, party which just won in our recent elections, they campaigned just to stop the drones over there. Because a lot of incidents over there were that they just targeted the wrong guy. Mm -hmm. And they kill them. So it's really a bad thing yeah. over there. Yeah. Well, you know, for every mm -hmm. person you harm, a hundred might you know, be angry, and then you create a bigger problem, and you hit the wrong people, and it's it's just not an effective way to do things. Even if even if you agree with it as a technology, uh, yeah. it just is not effective. So, mm -hmm. and I, I think especially what will, will change America's viewpoint on that is as this technology spreads. I mean, I think the temptation to use it when you're the only one who has it is very strong. But we're rapidly getting to the point where we're going to see, as you saw, 70 nations developing their own. I think that will help to finally get this into some situation where we can get a legal framework. Because it's not in anyone's interest to continue where we're going, because that's just a free-for-all. So, so and do you have ideas about this legal framework? What does it look like? Well, just yeah. say you can't do it, it's not enough? Well, no, I I, I, here's the thing, though. Um, we've done this with all sorts of, laser blinding weapons is a great example. I mean, we cannot sit here and think of all the horrible incidents with laser blinding weapons because people sat down and said, yeah, it's very easy to blind people and win a bet. Let's not do that. And sure enough, there are all these international controls. So drones are a little different because they actually have some civilian uses. Mm -hmm. So you will have instances where individuals are, or small groups are putting weapons on drones. And that's why I was thinking of having an immune system, this idea that we would create, you know, drones that would look for other drones and, and then bring them to the attentions of humans. They wouldn't shoot them out of the sky. But there is no way you're going to stop everything. But you don't want to militarize your entire society to defend it against robots. Actually, let's, um, let's use one of the better the benefits of technology. Sure. Why don't we actually bring some of the Skype people in? Yes, hello. <laughs> A non-threatening technology. Um, um, I don't think that the technology is going to be available in a couple of years because I've found some sites that cite that you can actually build the majority of parts for a drone with a 3D printer. So the drones are around the corner for small <laughs> groups, not in just for terrorist organizations and countries. So I don't think that a convention that you spoke about in your TED talk is going to do it. I think we need a broader perspective, more internet-based. Um, I don't know if you have any suggestions. I think we would all appreciate. Well, I am curious. When you said, you know, a, a broader solution, do you have any idea what that might be? No, I would. I was hoping you would have it. <laughs> <laughs> See, now let me say, when I say an international legal framework, that's really just the beginning. It's again to try to change the psychology of people to say more than just, hey, look at this cool stuff we can do with these weapons. 
But it's the next step. It's an appreciation for how it would erode democracy, this idea of popular government, making that connection. More than just that these are dangerous weapons individually, they could hurt people, they can hurt our whole society. So I take your point, I mean, you're right in a way, but it's the best I can come up with and, and you know, I guess I have a devious mind, which is why I write these things, but <laughs> even with that devious mind, I can't come up with a perfect solution for it, so. Hugo, you have a comment? Yeah, um, when we look back at our current, uh, current technologies, um, the most um, uh, efficient ones, like the GPS, uh, the internet, or uh, the radar, um, those are technologies that we got from the military, right? So what's my question for you is, um, how is it different with drones now? I don't think it is. But think I about don't think that. so. But think about that. GPS is used by all of us, really. Mm -hmm. And I think how great it is. I'm actually rather optimistic about human nature. I, I try to view it as a bell curve. And I think on either extreme, you have people doing extreme things. But most people want to get through their life and do good things and, and be with their families. And so they'll take those technologies, whether they were developed by the military or not, and they'll do cool, peaceful things with them. So logistics, environmental, yes. mm -hmm. uh, monitoring, search and rescue, aerial photography. And then, yes, you'll have these people who are going to arm them. And then they'll you know, have one attack. And it, hopefully it will make them a pariah. Because I, I think what would change a lot of Americans' point of views about it is if, you know, if America was being attacked like this, then certainly it would be a page one issue that we have to deal with. So now I'm not saying I want that to happen, but this is where that goes. If you look just a few years down the line, given the price point and the accessibility of the technology, as you pointed out, you know, every country will have these and be tempted to use them to solve intractable, intractable problems or problems nobody wants to deal with. And again, it's that anonymity thing. And that's why we have to get ahead of it and at least declare that that's a very bad way to go because it will destabilize, well, geopolitics as we know it. And that would be very bad. So. Anya? I just had a question. Are yes. you alone in your fight against drones? Like, are you alone in pursuing oh, God, the convention? No. Or do you have any, <laughs> um, like, I don't know, associations, NGOs helping you? Well, I, again, I was just saying that, you know, I've talked to people at Human Rights Watch. I think they're dealing with a group called Article 36. There's the International Committee on Robotics Arms Control. These are all good organizations. Um, I am not directly affiliated with them, but I strongly sympathize with what they're trying to do. And am I alone? Definitely not. I think there's a lot of people who are very concerned about this. Uh, both autonomous drones as well as remotely piloted drones that are being used for, for you know, extrajudicial assassinations, essentially. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people are really upset that they want to prevent this from happening. So no, I don't think I'm alone. Okay. I, I just wanted to, I wanted to bring you into the conversation if you have any additional questions for, for Daniel or comments. I was thinking, OK, it sounds inevitable. It's going to happen. We're going to have killer robots in a few years. So should we focus on defense and maybe uh, push the, the research to, towards uh, open research instead of banning it and to making sure the defense systems can be as good as the bad guys? See, that's interesting because I think I started from that viewpoint, that idea that it would be important for democracies not just to have robotic drones in defense, but the best robotic drones in defense. Um, I've really come around to the idea that that's a bad way to go. Because I really do think that it shifts the balance so much toward offense that defense is really untenable. I think the best defense is to, to again, not build the damn thing. That said, I think we can have very advanced systems that are busy snaring or detecting other drones to give humans the head up so that they can say, oh, yeah, that's them again. And then have a human make a lethal decision to, let's say, destroy that drone. I, I don't think having killer robots running around overhead, that's just going to get ugly real fast, you know. And then it's going to be again robots against robots, the good ones. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Except, you know, this is the interesting, because I, I hear this a lot. What's wrong with bloodless war? And I don't know, I feel like telling these people, didn't you see Terminator? Damn it. It's like, <laughs> it's a difference between humans fighting in a war or just being the targets. Mm -hmm. Because let's face it, the weak point there would be, well, we got to get around their drones so we hit the leadership and the citizens and make them pay. And then the humans will just be the targets at that point. I think it'll be each side's robots killing humans. The point is that I don't think we should build them uh, at all. And I think we should make sure that they don't have weapons on them. So. 
Okay, I think we've, we've actually run out of time. Oh. I want to make sure that everybody has time to get back into the theater. So, Daniel, thank you so much for joining us. Obviously, pleasure. you've given us tremendous to, lots to think about. Um, thank you for joining us from Skype around the Thanks, world. Guys. Um, and everyone, please, please come back. At, we're here actually at every break throughout the week uh, with speakers all week. So, look forward to seeing you then. So, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.